kind of a fun talk for me to do because it's uh, in the world of psychiatry we've been talking about ADHD forever really but it's largely been related to kids and the idea that it's an adult disorder has sort of become pretty it's pretty common thinking in the states over the last eight or perhaps ten years and now it uh, in Canada, probably the last five or six years, we're sort of really catching up on what we should know about ADHD in adults. Really in the States, you see people, uh, there's a lot of educational information coming out about ADHD now around the world. And uh, so it's kind of, it's not like a new illness, but it's new in the world of the adult psychiatrist, I think. So for me, it's still kind of everything else that seems like I've been treating for as long as I've been in town is been there for a very long time and this is sort of a little a little bit new and it's kind of fun because uh, there are some uh, people who are really up on it and know all about it and lots of people that don't so it's just something a bit novel I think. It's also kind of I think uh, one of the claims to fame that ADHD has if you make a good diagnosis and your patient does have adult ADHD with some of the medications that we use we can see a very marked improvement almost overnight which is a pretty rare thing in most aspects most areas of psychiatry, most areas of medicine really. So it's kind of fun sometimes to have somebody in the ward who's really quite sick and nobody knows what's wrong or nobody's figured it out for a decade or two and you give them something and in a couple of days they come and tell you they feel like a whole different person. It doesn't happen very often unless you're a surgeon, which I'm certainly not. So that part of it is kind of fun for me. <clears throat> you have to excuse my voice isn't uh, quite what it should be tonight, but we'll do our best here. So. Um, so this slide kind of points out, as I already said, that the focus on ADHD over the years has really been kids. Um, so in children, the prevalence of ADHD kind of ranges according to what you read, anywhere from 3% to 10%. And you can see that in children, a little more than 50% of them probably get treated some sort of treatment. Whereas in adults, uh, the prevalence is estimated at being about 5%, 4% to 5%. And out of them, only 10% get care. So it's 10% in adults versus 50, 60% in kids. Part of that is, as I said, the sort of the state of knowledge about ADHD in adults is just kind of evolving. Um, so until recently, uh, there's been lots and lots of efforts to understand ADHD. If you think back, I mean, people have been talking about hyperactive kids for longer than I've been alive, probably. And, so, of course, when people discover these things and pharmaceutical companies think that maybe they have something to offer, then we end up with all sorts of research. And so there's been a lot of research about it, but most of it is in the area of children. And the, the research in the area of uh, ADHD in adults and what makes adult ADHD different from children and should there be different treatments, et cetera, is all still relatively new. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, of course, are energetically doing their thing because they see a big market and a big place for them to come in and make some money. So there's lots of research in terms, terms of drugs and pharmaceutical development, but of course there's always a lot more to be known about a, an illness or a condition uh, than just medications. So uh, we're getting there. So really <clears throat> up until uh, perhaps 10 years ago, the research uh, and the clinicians involved in treating ADHD whether they be pediatricians or child psychiatrists or adult psychiatrists, we've tended to think that this is just something that kids grow out of. So there hasn't been a big focus on uh, everybody just thinks that, you, you know, you, if your child has ADHD and he's 10, then you take him to the pediatrician or the doctor and perhaps they put him on a bit of medication that might help things or might not and they stay on this till perhaps they're in grade uh, 10 or grade 11 and then when they go off to university or finish high school, people just seem to forget about it. And uh, then when they get in trouble, uh, with their mental health or something like that. Uh, when they're 20 or 30, people used to not think about this, you know. So now, it's interesting now, I think we're thinking more and more about it. So really the research does show that if you look at all the kids in the world that ever truly were diagnosed with a, a syndrome of ADHD, that 65% of those kids that truly had a diagnosis of ADHD when they were kids uh, continue to have some kind of symptomatic presentation when they're adults. So 65% of kids that have a genuine diagnosis of ADHD when they're kids will have some enough symptoms when they're adults to cause them problems. So having said that, it doesn't mean that they'll fully fit the criteria for full-blown ADHD, but it does mean that two-thirds of them will continue to have some symptoms that interfere 
with their ability to carry on at work or carry on in relationships or carry on socially. And as the hour goes on, we'll talk a little more about how ADHD interferes with people's lives socially and at work and uh, in relationships as well. Lots of different areas. So typically, uh, this slide would show you that in the younger person, the thing that everybody notices about the hyperactive kid is the hyperactivity. Um, when kids get it, when this sort of in the younger in the younger age group, the things that we really see are the hyperactivity and the impulsiveness. So you can see here that you know young kids are impulsive, they have inattention problems, and they also have hyperactivity problems. And as people get older, the hyperactivity tends to settle down, and the impulsivity tends to settle down, and the inattention becomes a big problem. <clears throat> so in adults, I mean, part of the reason that uh, the more difficult to diagnose is, I think what makes kids pretty easy to diagnose is we, you can go into a classroom and you can see these kids that historically have trouble sitting still, and they're getting into trouble with the teacher, and they're being sent to the principal's office because they can't sit still, and they're impulsive, and they're goofing around because they're impulsive and they can't sit still, and their hyperactivity settles down as they kind of get to be 16, 17, 18. So in a lot of young kids that have ADHD when they're children, the hyperactivity part settles, 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 and by the time they get to be perhaps 20, mostly what they're left with is a lot of inattentive problems and some impulsiveness. So that's not to say that the hyperactivity goes away in all these people, because we see quite a number of adults, whether they're 30 or 40, who still feel like they're hyperactive, but they've kind of learned to sit still. So I see people that will come into my office and uh, you can tell quickly that they're fidgeting and they're restless and they can't sit still and they're squirming and they're picking at this and squirming around. And then you see other people that look to be sitting still pretty, pretty well, but if you ask them once you've figured out what the diagnosis is, usually they'll tell you still that they feel like they still have some kind of motor running around inside them and yes, they look like they're not hyperactive or that they're not restless anymore, but really they still feel that inner restlessness, but they've learned how to cover it up. And a lot of people do that, you know, if you have, if you have depression or if you have chronic pain or if you have a motor that makes you want to be moving all the time, you learn after a while how to make yourself perhaps look more normal than you feel, I think. So because of this business of the adults sort of not looking at, they're not as obvious to spot because of this stuff. So it makes it a little more challenging. So just to give you an idea of how common it is, it sort of fits in the middle here. So these, these disorders are more common. Depression is more common. Social phobia, like fear of an airplane, fear of sp spiders is more common. People who use, abuse various substances is more common than people who have ADHD. And then things that are less common are PTSD, panic disorder, and bipolar disorder. So it's interesting, I think, that no, it does occur at a frequency that is equal to or greater than panic disorder, bipolar disorder. Just to give you a kind of an idea of what, to put it in perspective of how common it is. So these are the adult symptoms. <clears throat> We've already shown you these things. Adults have a lot of trouble with inattention and it's more common in adults than the hyperactivity part. The hyperactivity part in adults often gets internalized as more of a feeling of restless, restlessness and tension, but people, you still see a lot of people with the adult ADHD who haven't learned effectively to control that sort of need to keep moving and they're on the move all the time or they're restless and fidgeting. So some of them are and some of them are not. And I'm not really sure that it's fair to say the hyperactivity goes away rather than people just seem to control it better. Because it seems to me that most people that I talk to who say they were very hyperactive as kids, and I say to them, well, you look pretty calm now, they usually say, well, I look calm, but I don't feel all that calm inside. So I think they're still very frequently aware of the need to, or the temptation to be hyperactive, but they're controlling it. The executive dysfunction problems, <clears throat> excuse me, causes lots of problems in adults. So um, executive dysfunction in people refers to those higher level brain or cognitive functions. So. If you kind of if you kind of know that you would like to take a holiday in a couple of years and you have this much money in your bank account, then the figuring out that you have to do to get from A to B is kind of all part of executive functioning. So it's the more complex functioning where you take various pieces of information like your budget, the the, the temperature of the year where you want to go to, who you're going to go with, what kind of a climate you want to travel to, and put all these things together and you come up with some kind of a plan. So it's uh, executive functioning refers to that 
part of our cognition or our thinking where we're doing more complicated things and just saying, well, that's black and that's red and this hurts, where you're taking a whole bunch of information and integrating it into a plan using a whole bunch of different areas of your brain. And when you have dysfunction like that, perhaps because the part of your brain that controls impulsiveness isn't working very well and the part of your brain that controls attention isn't working very well, then the patterns and the parts of your, the circuits of your brain that all have to function synchronously in order for you to smoothly plan things down the road and think about all the options and weigh the pros and cons, et cetera, doesn't work very well in people with, a lot, with, people with ADHD for the most part. So you, you, I mean, you really do some, see some very successful people with ADHD, but they have huge barriers to their success. So they have lots of energy, these people. Sometimes they're as passionate about their work as anybody else, but their impulsiveness and their hyperactivity gets in the way. And I think it's important to point out with this illness, <clears throat> Excuse me, it's like any other, most other things that we see in medicine, we see people that are so incredibly ADHD that I don't know how in the world you'd expect them to function in any kind of a job for more than a year. And then you see other people that are distur disturbed by their fidgetiness and their hyperactivity and their impulsiveness, but they can overcome it. And so some of that is, you know, like everything else, some people have a nasty form of the illness where they, their symptoms are severe and some people have a milder form where they have a bit of this and a bit of that and they still could still make the diagnostic criteria but perhaps they're not as ill as other people are so like every other branch of medicine we see people that kind of have a bad case and a not so bad case so some of them of course manage pretty well with their adhd and some of them really struggle so there's a, it's i think it's important to know that across the spectrum of psychiatry and and medicine in general, we have a, there's always people with, that are you know, much worse off in terms that compared to others that are doing better because uh, some of the illnesses are, some, of the, some people suffer these illnesses more, more so and are more impaired than other people. So just a bit of a comparison about how some of these things look in adults compared to kids. You know, when your child is inattentive, they just basically don't listen and they're jumping all around in the classroom. <clears throat> when adults are inattentive, they have difficulty finishing things because they can't focus their attention long enough. So as an adult, you often would get a relatively complex task. If somebody gives you a pretty easy one-minute task or a ten-minute task, you might do all right. But if you have a more complex task, then often things will, be get, less, will get left until the last minute. <clears throat> so I think a typical thing with ADHD would people would say, well, you know, I really do have trouble with focusing, and if you ask me if I can watch a movie, off the time, oftentimes it's difficult for me to pay attention to that movie, unless it's something I really like. So with young people, say 20-year-old people, people say, oh yeah, I can really play those video games, and I can pay a lot of attention to that, because that's a very stimulating kind of a game, that they're very, you know, they're putting a lot of energy and effort into staying focused, and they can do that often with something where they really put in a lot of effort. So. For example, somebody with mild ADHD um, or attention problems, often you'll find that in school, you know, they're terrible at the courses that they don't like, but if they really put in a big effort for some of the exams or if they're courses that they really are interested in, they try harder, you know, then they can do better because uh, there is self-control over some of this stuff to some reasonable degree. So, you know, I, I one of the ladies I looked after for a long time, uh, has a very high level managerial job with one of the social agencies in town and she does a wonderful job with everything but when it comes to at the end of the month she has to produce a whole bunch of 10 page reports and all of these people that she's working with it, she never gets it done until the end of the month and at the end of the month she's up for two nights straight and can do a wonderful job on her reports when the pressure is on enough for her to force herself to focus and she doesn't her desk is a disaster she's completely disorganized she gets everything done in a very haphazard fashion but when it comes to completing tasks that require focus and concentration over a prolonged period of time and integrating a whole bunch of information, she can't do it until the pressure is really on. So she's always kind of a last minute person. And the people will say, you can always tell when your ADHD clients come to see you because they're always late because they can't sort of get it together to be there on time and it gets in their way of their planning. <clears throat> when adults are hyperactive, they tend to look for active jobs uh, and they, or they have this inner restlessness their impulsiveness sort of shows up more in job changes or driving problems or traffic accidents. Also shows up in other things like relationships that make impulsive choices, buying things that make impulsive choices. I mean, just about anywhere where you have to make a decision, if you make it impulsive, you're gonna end up having trouble with spending, you're gonna have trouble with girlfriends, you're gonna have trouble with your family, you're gonna have trouble with the law. Impulsive, impulsivity can cause lots of trouble. 
So the consequences of uh, adult ADHD untreated. So just in general, looking at some of the sort of global changes that uh, have been reported to be found in adults with ADHD, they tend to do not as well in school, so they, have, they tend to have a lower educational level. Probably a, partly as a result of that and partly because of impulsive job changes, they have less annual income. Uh, it's not uncommon to see these people come to see you and you ask them about their job history and they'll have three or five or sometimes even ten jobs every year for four or five years because they're always impulsively quitting or they have trouble staying focused on their job or they get distracted by something else. So very difficult to, st to hang on to a job for a lot of these people. Hanging on to relationships is difficult, so lots of divorce, more legal problems, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. And they're less satisfied with family, social, and professional lives. So they're less happy people. Um, I remember sitting in my office a couple of years ago and I had a medical student with me, I think, and I had a patient come in that I'd picked up from the legal system who had serious adult ADHD. And, uh, and we had got her on some medications and she was feeling a lot better. And so she wanted to speak to the resident who was with me and she said to my young doctor, you know, when you're out there practicing in family practice and people come to you and you're wondering when is my next patient going to show up with adult ADHD, she said, don't expect them to come in and say I have ADHD. They will probably come in and say they're unhappy. And they're unhappy because their family isn't working, their job isn't working, their banking isn't working. And so they often will present with a story of I'm very unhappy, maybe I don't even feel like being around anymore, but they're unhappy because things aren't working. So her message was, don't expect people to come in and say, I think I'm hyperactive, or I think I still have this thing that got me kicked out of school when I was in grade six. They're more likely to come in and say, I'm dissatisfied with my life. And that's how she had showed up. She had attempted to kill herself and ended up in the justice system somehow, and then we got our hands on her. So. And then she did very well. So, And she was particularly useful in sort of trying to educate uh, some of the people in our little system downtown about adult ADHD. So just a pretty graph that sort of illustrates some of the things that I've already said. Uh, it shows you here that in terms of relationships with parents, they don't do very well. Getting along with their friends, they don't do as well as people that don't have ADHD. Their divorce rate is almost double. Separation rate is double. Stable relationships with partner, they don't do so well. So those are relationship impairments, examples. So you, get to get a, you begin to get a picture that ADHD doesn't just affect your ability to do well in grade 12. It affects your relationships, affects your work, affects uh, things that you will do for friends. So in terms of functional as an adult, you know, the percentage of these people that uh, repeat a grade or triple, people that don't have adult ADHD, the number that don't complete high school is very much greater than those that don't have ADHD. The risk of teen pregnancy is enormously greater. It's because of impulsiveness for the most part. And because you'll see in a minute, these people tend to get involved in substances and recre and substances and looking for you know things that stimulate them. So poor choices, poor judgment, impulsiveness, lots and lots of substance abuse, double, accidents, quadruple, serious car accidents, triple, arrests, almost double. So really, that's a pretty impressive graph, honestly. When you stop and look at all the various things that are on that graph and how many of them. There's such a huge spread and difference between the normal kind of controls and the ADHD people. So if any of you know anybody that has horrible ADHD, you know, you probably recognize some of this stuff where the substance abuse and accident prone and car accidents. I remember 10 years ago or more, I was at a meeting somewhere in the States and they were pushing some new drug that was being used for the treatment of ADHD and they put us in this, they put me in this little booth <clears throat> and I had a kind of a TV camera surrounding me and the idea was that I was sitting in this booth and I was supposed to be seeing the road uh, through the eyes of some young guy that was driving this car around town. So this young guy was driving this car around town and you know he was he was talking on his cell phone with one hand and he was trying to jangle with the radio on the other hand and he was pumping on the gas and on the brake with the other hand and he was looking at the girls on the street over here and you just thought my god should this guy really have a driver's license because he was just all over the place and when you really think about it somebody can't sustain any focus and is very distractible by everything going on around him and wants lots of stimulation while he's doing this boring driving is probably not going to do very well behind a car so um, often ADHD occurs, co-occurs with other psychiatric problems. 
Most commonly it co-occurs with these. The ODD and CD are, these are childhood disorders, so uh, this diagnosis, as I said before, originally was a childhood diagnosis. In the latest edition of our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it's been, the childhood section has been eliminated, and this, now this diagnosis is considered a, a diagnosis and occur, can occur across, across the lifespan. But there are still a couple of things included in here that are childhood diagnosis. So these are conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, are more common with ADHD. In the adult, uh, antisocial personality disorder is often thought to be more prevalent in ADHD than in others. And substance abuse is found to be very common. It's kind of an interesting thing, I think. So you have a lot of, uh, you'll see that we break ADHD down into two categories diagnostically. One group are the people that are hyperactive and impulsive, and the other group are ones that are predominantly inattentive, that don't have so much hyperactivity. So the ones, I think, that are very hyperactive, you can understand that they would want to use a substance that's tranquilizing to calm them down, because I think they just would like to relax a little more often. So things that might calm you down nicely would be things like alcohol and cannabis. Some of the ones that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's interesting, uh, one of my favorite questions to ask people if I think that they might well have ADHD and they're involved in the world of street drugs or played around with street drugs, often if you ask somebody who's as a hyperactive type of ADHD, if they've used uh, something like, like a stimulant like cocaine or crystal meth, um, and if they have, then you sort of ask them, well, when you did crystal meth, did you, did you wake up and get full of energy and run around the room like everybody else? And it's amazing how many of them will say, no, no, I didn't do that. When I find when I use cocaine, I can sit down and I can read my book. And it's the only time I can read. And some of them will say, you know, I go for a whole week and I'm running around partying or doing whatever I'm doing. And when I really want to sleep, I go out and use some cocaine. So it's kind of this whole notion that in the ADHD patient, the stimulant drug seems to settle them. It's quite interesting. I think when somebody tells you that, I think you really have to stop and wonder what the heck is going on when somebody's using a very, very stimulating drug in order to go to sleep. There's something funny about their neurochemistry, so they smoke more than most people. So in other disorders, if you look at the group of people in the world that are depressed, the frequency of ADHD is 16% versus about 5%, which was in the normal control group. Bipolar disorder, about 10% versus 5%. Panic disorder, 25%. Substance abuse, very high number. I mean, if you look at people in this, in these, this was a group of three or four studies. They found almost between 65 and 75% of people that were classified as substance abusers had ADHD. That's an enormous number when you stop and think about it, you know? So it kind of makes you wonder what are the possibilities of helping people with some of the substance abuse stuff. and. You know, it becomes a bit of a double-edged sword because you find a lot of people. And one of the clinics I do in conjunction with Canadian Mental Health is operate a clinic at the Buffalo Hotel downtown. And, you know, often when I go there, one of the staff will say to me, we really want you to see this guy tonight. We're sure he's got the worst case of ADHD that we've ever seen. And, you know, so you see these people that seem truly sometimes have horrible ADHD, but then you're faced with the question, you know, are you going to give this person Ritalin and send him home because he's a drug addict? Or are you going to give him Dexedrine and send him home? Or should you give him Dexedrine while he's drinking? Or, you know, it becomes more complicated, right? But uh, it's interesting to see. He's probably, honestly, some of the worst, most symptomatic people with ADHD that I've met have been down in the Buffalo Hotel or now people referred in from downtown. Um, it's also interesting, I think, that uh, 27% of people that are obese have ADHD, um, and 40, almost 50%, 40% of people who are morbidly obese with a BMI greater than 40, so this is the morbidly obese, very significantly obese people, 40% of them have uh, ADHD in multiple studies. So if you Google that, about the relationship between ADHD and morbid obesity, it will come up consistently and tell you and verify this number, that it usually runs somewhere between 35 and 45 percent. So, and then you ask people, well, why, why is that happening? What, what's with that? And I don't know that anybody really knows. I think the favorite theory is the impulsive eating, you know? So it's kind of a patient who's unhappy with their life, or perhaps he's unhappy with his life, and they don't have a whole lot of willpower, and they want to they want to get their dopamine up through their pleasure reward cycles and so they're eating or doing something to make themselves happier. And so people talk about comfort eating 
And if, you know, if you want to do some comfort eating and you have no control over your impulsiveness, then your risk of getting into a lot of trouble potentially with obesity is probably fairly significant. So it's always been kind of an intriguing thing for me, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, has to do, I think, my think, with the impulsive eating, and also the fact that if you're very seriously ADHD, uh, as I said before, you might not be very happy with your life. So you have a kind of dissatisfied, unhappy person who has found that eating makes her feel a little better for a while, and she has no control over impulsiveness, so she's eating too much, and then becomes very significantly obese. In prison, uh, people have a 25% chance or risk of uh, ADHD. So when you see, when you look at some of these populations together, the substance abusers that are in prison, you, know, you get some pretty big numbers running around in the penitentiaries, I would think. So with respect to driving, I think uh, there's been a lot of uh, pressure from the various licensing bureaus around automobiles and driver's licenses across the world really for people to look more carefully at ADHD and the reasonableness or not of people with this illness having licenses. Because you look at these kind of statistics, these people are three times more likely to have repeated violations, they're three times more likely to be in a car accident, they're four times, times more likely to be found at fault in the car accident, they're seven times more likely to be in a whole bunch of accidents, and they're three times more likely to be in a serious enough accident to get injuries from their motor vehicle accidents. So really, again, you know, pretty significant statistics. And 48% of these people versus 9% of non-ADHD people end up having their license revoked or suspended at some time. So one of the things, just as a point of clarification, people used to talk about ADD. ADD was a term that existed back in the DSM-3, which is, I think, uh, in the late 70s, 1980, something like that. And we used it for quite a while, then we had DSM-4 for a long time. So DSM-4 and DSM-5, our current diagnostic manual, uh, calls this illness ADHD. So it's ADHD with or without hyperactivity or ADHD with or without inattentive symptoms, but I'll show you that on the slide in a second. So when we make a diagnosis of adult ADHD, we do it based on primarily on these three things. We look at symptoms. So we look at their difficulty with focus, we look at their dis disorganization, inability to get organized, and we look at restlessness, and we look at things like losing things, and other symptoms of uh, distractibility, focus, and hyperactivity. So we look at symptoms, and then we always look at impairment in all psychiatric diagnoses, pretty much. We don't make diagnoses in people if it's not really interfering with things. So if people come in and have some symptoms that sound like ADHD, even if they come in and say, I passed this little test that I found in Cosmopolitan and it says I have ADHD, if, they don't, if they're not impaired in their social life or their occupational life or their vocational life, we don't make a diagnosis. So if people are managing it well and it doesn't cause impairment, we don't diagnose. So it's, it's very, very important that if you have a patient who you feel has adult ADHD, if, if you can't establish that they had ADHD when they were a kid, then you better think of a different diagnosis because this, this is a diagnosis that begins in children and carries through to adulthood. It doesn't start in adulthood. So sometimes, you know, we see people that look like they're jumping all over the place and can't focus and can't pay attention, but it's not the only thing in the world that might cause that. And if you ask the question, you know, how did you do in school and were you well-behaved kid that got great marks and everybody liked you and you weren't a troublemaker and you can't establish that they had ADHD in school, then you shouldn't be thinking very seriously that they probably have it now. I mean, there are lots of examples where people don't get diagnosed in school. There's been lots of controversy about whether ADHD is a good thing to diagnose in kids over the years. Uh, the people that, have, that don't have the hyperactive component are harder to diagnose. Plus, some of, the, some of the people that don't have the hyperactive component, if they put in enough effort, sometimes their ability to focus will improve enough that they won't too bad, don't do too badly in school, and then they don't come to the attention of the school board or the teachers. So this is the criteria that exists in our little diagnostic manual. And you can see that, uh, although in the latest edition of the manual, this illness is not limited to children, that you can see from reading all that that it refers to children. And they took it out of the last edition of the DSM where it was in the section on childhood disorders and didn't change it. So in order to make a diagnosis of ADHD, you can see here that, so we have a diagnosis of ADHD and then it can be either the inattentive subtype 
or it can be the hyperactive impulsive subtype. So for the inattentive subtype, uh, these are not the people that are hyperactive, but these are the people that have a lot of problems with inattention as indicated by six or more of these criteria. So it's difficulty paying attention to details, making careless mistakes, difficulty sustaining attention in classroom and tasks or playing, um, often doesn't seem to listen because they're distractible and they can't focus, doesn't follow through because uh, their focus isn't solid and they can't complete and they can't follow through. Difficulty organizing, um, they avoid or dislike or reluctant to engage in tasks and require sustained mental effort. They often lose things because they're disorganized, uh, easily distracted and often forgetful. So that's kind of all of the symptoms that we talked about with respect to ADHD with the exception of the hyperactivity. So this, this group is the inattentive type that have the, have the impulsiveness um, but, and, the, and the inattention, but they don't have the hyperactivity. And often the, inattention, often the impulsiveness is pretty minor in this group also. It's more of an inattention thing. So we kind of see the impulsiveness sort of spans the two subgroups, this one and the hyperactive one, but it's much more common in the hyperactive one. So I hope I'm not confusing you there. So then we talk about the hyperactive subgroup of the ADHD people. So in a lot of places you'll see this referred to as the hyperactive impulsive subgroup. So the subgroup of hyperactive impulsive people that are also sh showing inattention, there be they, these are mostly then more motor symptoms described in the hyperactivity. They're fidgeting, they're restless, they squirm, they get up and down, they move all around, they run about, they cause trouble in class difficulty playing or engaging quietly. They always seem to be on the go as if driven, they talk too much, and they're impulsive. So they will, they have trouble waiting their turn and they'll blurt out answers before the question is being completed. They have difficulty awaiting their turn and they interrupt. So this is, you know, in an adult, it's often one of the things that makes, gets me wondering pretty quickly about uh, ADHD in adults and perhaps I guess it's because of what I do. I sit in my office or sit in the hospital and I interview people so I'm sitting and talking to people and asking a lot of questions when I'm asking questions and somebody keeps answering me before I finish my question over and over and over again and they're interrupting me and interrupting me and can't wait for me to finish my question it makes me wonder. I, I start to wonder if that's you know that's what we're talking about because you see that a lot I think. So and, and if you ask people uh, you know, have you had, do you have trouble waiting your turn if you're in a group and somebody's trying to come up, come up, come up with the answer and you're supposed to, you're supposed to be the first, fourth one to offer your suggestions? Do you have trouble waiting your turn when you're, you know, when you have the right answer? People have a lot of trouble waiting their turn because they're impulsive and because they're restless. And you see it in conversations because they don't wait for you to finish and they're always interrupting and they drive you crazy because they're always interrupting. So those are the kind of, sorry, those are kind of the formal criteria for ADHD. Uh, so in addition to those criteria that I showed you, then there has to be some of these symptoms that have been present since before the age of seven. So they must be there before the age of seven. Um, and these things must uh, cause some problems in at least, at least two areas. It could be home, could be work, could be school, so it be, could be social. And there must be clear evidence of clinically significant impairment in these areas. So it's not just the symptoms, that we have to see impairment uh, f in both places. So then after we've done all that in our diagnostic efforts, then we subtype these people according to combined, if they have a bit of, a bit of each subtype, um, or we can say that they're a hyperactive type, or we can say that they're predominantly hyperactive or not otherwise specified. So then. Um, probably inattentive, pre predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive, or not otherwise specified or combined. So really this then is a neurological brain disorder that manifests as a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity and impulsiveness that is much more frequent and much more severe that is typically then is typically absorb, observed in the public. <clears throat> and about 60% of kids with this will continue to have problematic symptoms when they're adults. So genetically, uh, when we look at kids or adults that have ADHD, about 25% of them, about 25% of their close relatives will also have ADHD. We also find that with ADHD adults or kids, the learning disabilities are more common uh, in their families. So they do tend to run in families, so therefore there probably is genetic influences that at this point are poorly understood. 
We said this, that the general rate in the population runs between 4 and 5 percent. And if you look at twins, uh, there's a strong correlation in identical twins, much more stronger in twins that are not identical, supporting the genetic notion behind ADHD. So there's been a lot of talk over the years about uh, social factors and child re rearing methods. So really, uh, not surprisingly, people started, people have always talked about, uh, is, do you think that child is really hyperactive if, if, if his parents would just sort of decide to discipline him properly and have more clear rules? People often believe that that would just sort of fix all the problems. So there's been a lot of studies to try and address that question. And as a result of all that, so far, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence to suggest that ADHD can arise from purely social or child rearing, rearing methods. But you have to understand that that doesn't mean that if you have an active kid and you raise him in an environment where there's no controls and no limits and no discipline, that he won't be a whole lot more of a handful than if you had lots of controls over him. It just means that he won't meet the criteria for a diagnosis of ADHD. So there are lots of active, restless, poorly behaved kids because of the environment that they're raised in that don't qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD. So it's not to say that those things don't exist, it's just to say that that doesn't seem to be the cause of ADHD the way we defined it tonight. <clears throat> so most of the substantiated causes that the research seems to find these days falls into the realm of neurobiology, brain chemistry problems, and genetics. Uh, lots of environmental factors may, of course, make this worse or make it better. Um, and espe probably especially the amount of impairment and the amount of suffering will have a lot to do with, can be influenced very greatly by various things in the environment. Um, but these environmental factors and social rearing factors don't seem to give rise to ADHD in and by themselves. So then we had lots of talk for a long time about um, a possible correlation between the use of cigarettes and alcohol during pregnancy and the risk of ADHD. So currently, of course, we still are suggesting to people for a multitude of reasons not to smoke, not to drink um, when they're pregnant, not just because your child may have ADHD, but for all, all the other reasons that everybody's aware of. There was some concern for quite some time about high levels of lead being found in the, body, in the brains of young preschool kids. So there was, I think, at least two fairly large studies that did show that kids with serious ADHD problems had more lead. Um, that was part of the reason that lead was sort of, uh, people addressed the issue of the concentrations of lead in paint. <clears throat> and there was con you know, high concentrations of lead in some uh, community water levels. So those things have kind of been addressed, but uh, clearly lead still, still exists in the environment. We all have lead within our bodies. so. It seems that lead may play some role in ADHD, but doesn't explain it entirely by any means. We also know that in some brain injured people, particularly children, that they may later show a constellation of symptoms that are similar to ADHD. On the other hand, only a pretty small percentage of kids with ADHD actually had a, had a head injury. So then we've talked about we we'll talk a bit about sugar and food additives. So again, this was something that was, uh, you no know, very common talk. I think for a long time that maybe sugar was the cause of ADHD, and so they did lots of studies about that stuff and found that, uh, you know, re using very careful dietary restrictions in children seemed to improve and improve things in kids about five percent of those kids with ADHD, and a lot of the kids that saw, had the improvement were kids with food allergies. Um, and then there was a number of double-blind studies showing using sugar, aspartame, and placebo. And these studies repeatedly didn't show any significant effects of sugar on, on hyperactivity or inattentiveness. So again, of course, mothers are going to say, well, I give my kids sugars, and then we have behavior problems, or we give them candies, and they all go wild on Halloween night. So nobody's really disputing that. It's back to the whole business of sugar doesn't give you the symptoms that would allow you to meet the criteria to make a diagnosis of ADHD. So in the United States with the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, they undertook a huge study, probably the largest one ever, did, ever, ever that was ever done, looking at various ways of treating kids with ADHD. So they looked at these four groups. Some groups they gave just medication. Some kids they gave only psychotherapy or behavioral management strategies. And then some of the kids got both, and some of them really got nothing. So some of them had medication management alone. Some of them had... Uh, behavioral treatment for their ADHD, some had both. 
then it's not surprising you would find out that the com combined treatments uh, along with medication for most kids were more superior. There was a few areas, like in these kids, if they had a lot of anxiety, if they were having trouble at school, if they were being more defiant than most, getting, having difficulty getting along with their parents, things like that where you'd expect some counseling, some advice, some behavioral management to make a difference for anybody, it did make a difference. So uh, generally speaking, it seems like medication uh, has a doesn't have a, cons a consistently positive effect, but the success rate with medication is probably greater than the success rate that it was just behavioral treatment. But as in this case, as in most cases, if you combine the two, you're probably going to get the, the best, best result, I think. So really then, uh, diagnosing ADHD is, it really isn't a very easy task in an adult. Um, I think part of that is sort of uh, there aren't a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of information out there yet about uh, that family doctors are getting. This, you know, I think it's becoming more and more common in medical school for people to learn about adult ADHD, but it sort of takes a while for these things to filter into the curriculum. It takes a while for nurses to become more aware of it. It takes a while for it to get into the world of psychology. It sort of takes time. So it's, uh, it's not really an easy task. Uh, often we find that uh, Parents will come in uh, with their children to see a child psychiatrist perhaps uh, about the kid's ADHD and then the parent will wonder themselves that maybe they don't have similar problems. So it's fairly, I remember a couple of years back one of the child psychiatrists downstairs <clears throat> um, called me and said that uh, he had a young boy that um, he had just diagnosed as ADHD and he was sitting and talking to this young boy's mother I think and then the mother was listening to all these questions and decided that surely she must have ADHD also. So the child psychiatrist called me and asked me if I would see the mother who in fact did have ADHD. So then I was seeing the mother for quite a while and then about a year later I got asked to see the grandfather who also ended up having ADHD. So often families sort of become more aware of what it means to have ADHD when somebody in their family gets diagnosed, most often a kid, and then the parents start to say, well, boy, that sounds a lot like me when I was a kid, and maybe it still sounds like me when I'm an adult, and maybe I should go ask my doctor. So I think we see a lot of people that uh, come in and ask themselves about the possibility of a diagnosis, uh, either because uh, their wife or their child or their grandfather or somebody got the diagnosis. Uh, so we mentioned this before, that often people are coming and looking for help around dissatisfaction with their life. If you go through all the possible reasons for that and eliminate the, the likelihood that they're depressed, you might find out that ADHD is giving them a lot of trouble in their existence. Often they'll have a history of school failures or problems at work and frequent car accidents. So those are the kind of things that we think of when we try to evaluate somebody with this. So there are some things that kind of can look a bit like ADHD, but I think they're usually pretty easy, easy to separate. When you look at people that are ever depressed, then typically they, re, they will report concentration difficulties, attention problems, and memory problems. These are all problems that are pretty common with depressed people. And because they don't have a lot of motivation, they don't feel very well, often they don't get things done or don't get them done in a very timely fashion. So what makes it different, of course, is with depression, you have this ongoing day after day after day poor mood or depressive mood or lack of ability to enjoy yourself, which is not part of ADHD. So they're pretty, they're really pretty easy to separate when you really sit down and ask the right questions. People uh, with bipolar disorder, they tend to be hyperactive at times. They have difficulty maintaining attention and focus when they're hyperactive and in a manic state. What makes them distinctive is that they have this enduring picture of mood swings. They have euphoric moods and very depressive moods. Sometimes they have delusions. So there are some very distinctive things that occur in bipolar that don't occur in, high, in ADHD. So pretty easy to disentangle most of the time. If, when you see people that have um, bipolar disorder and ADHD together, then it gets, seems to become, it's more challenging. And you worry about that a bit because if somebody's bipolar and you know that they are hyperactive or have ADHD as well, then you think about, am I going to give them a stimulant? And if I give them a stimulant, is it going to drive them, is it going to affect their mood and make them more manic or destabilize their mood so that they'll do worse in terms of the bipolar, even though they might do better on the stimulant as far as the ADHD goes. So they're more of a diagnostic challenge um, when you see them together, but when you're 
trying to differentiate the two, one from the other, it's usually not horribly difficult. People that are very, very anxious uh, often are fidgety and they have difficulty concentrating and because they don't concentrate, they tend to forget and sometimes they don't finish things. Uh, the things that are different again is they, very, very anxious people have this very exaggerated sense of apprehension or they worry nonstop and they have a lot of somatic symptoms of anxiety. Um, so again, usually fairly easy to differentiate. Uh, these things sometimes are a little more difficult to differentiate. Uh, so both ADHD people and people that are substance abusing may or will have difficulties with attention, concentration, memory, mood swings. Depends on what they're, what they're using, how often they've been using it, when they last, last used it. Sometimes these are things that they will come in and complain of. Things that, of course, that are d distinctive is the obvious uh, pattern of substance abuse with all the consequences that go with that. And also in personality disorders with borderline, for example, uh, borderline people are famous for being very, very, very impulsive and having a lot of mood instability. Uh, what makes them, uh, the antisocial people are different because uh, the antisocial personality would have a long history of arrest, lack of respect for rules here and there. Uh, re and the borderline people have this re repeated pattern of self-injurious behavior, suicidal thinking going on in, uh, in sort of an endless fashion. So again, they, they differentiate from ADHD people in those fashions. So again, usually not too difficult to differentiate. I find what's really hard, again, is to treat the borderline personality disorder who also has ADHD or to be, to be convinced. Uh, sometimes you get stuck wondering if they have both and trying to, dis to really do a good job about that, I find is really hard and takes quite a lot of clinical attention sometimes to sort it out thoroughly. So when it comes to treating these people, this page sort of lists of, lists of the advantages of deciding you're going to try some medication treatment. So about 80% of people that, uh, this page refers to stimulants, about 80% of people that uh, try a stimulant will get some benefit. It's certainly not to say that anywhere near 80% of people will get full benefit, but 80% of people will report some benefit. And the stimulants seem to largely reduce the impulsiveness and to allow them to focus more efficiently, more effectively. They do sometimes seem to settle hyperactivity and sometimes not so much. It seems like often they work more on the impulsiveness and the focus, but they end up feeling more calm and more able to sit still. And as I said before, it's kind of interesting because sometimes it can happen almost overnight. Uh, when drug therapy is helpful, people feel better about themselves, not surprisingly. They tend to feel better about themselves. They tend to feel happier about their life. Uh, their self-esteem seems to get better. And it, like any other illness that you can help somebody recover from or help somebody improve their symptoms, I think they have a general sense of feeling better about themselves and about life. <clears throat> when you have somebody on stimulants, their thinking becomes more organized. That would be the goal of treatment if you get more organized thinking. Yeah, generally that will translate into people having more organized lives in which they seem to manage to be able to hold relationships a little longer, more st have a more steady work employment history, less trouble with the law, better drivers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they, you know, I think if you have a lot of internal thoughts uh, that are disorganized, then stimulants will allow you to get all that stuff sort of more organized and then as a result you sort of, that more organized thinking is reflected in your behavioral changes in your life. So those are seen as kind of some of the advantages to considering treatment with stimulants if you have a diagnosis of ADHD. The disadvantages are conversely 20% of people won't get any help at all from stimulants. Uh, sometimes for people with ADHD in particular, it's difficult to take your pills every day on time. ADHD doesn't uh, cure ADHD, but it symptomatically will control a good deal of the symptoms for quite a number of people. And often if you go on these medications and they work fairly well for you, you may be stuck being on them for a long time. Of course, it'd be your choice, but uh, you know, generally this is a, a life, a pretty lengthy condition often. It's referred to as a lifelong condition, so. Uh, side effects of medications are sometimes a problem. The most common things are come from the fact that you're using stimulants, so sleep disturbance is pretty common. Uh, an amphetamine or a stimulant is likely to reduce your appetite, so you might lose weight. Um, these are not horribly common. The sleep disturbance thing is usually pretty easy to get around, I would say, in 80% of people. 
Um, you just sort of need to make sure that the stimulant drug is out of their brain when it's time to go to sleep. Um, weight loss uh, is sometimes a problem for some people. Uh, again, usually it's not a big deal. It's not a horribly common thing. Uh, it's not very common in the sense that it causes weight loss to the point that it's disturbing to the people or the physician, but sometimes it's an issue and we certainly watch for, watch for it. <clears throat> um, and also in adults, uh, stimulants, amphetamines or stimulants can crank up your blood pressure a bit. So if you have blood pressure problems or other cardiac problems, you need to be monitored for that. Um, and there's not really a lot, a lot of studies out there yet looking at the long-term effects of uh, these drugs. But really, they say that, but now I think uh, when you think back to how many years we've been seeing kids being on stimulants, it's not, it's not going to be very long before we have some pretty long, long-term studies about the long-term effects of these drugs, which is pretty nice these days because people are getting, patients are becoming more and more educated and they not only want to know what are the common side effects I'm going to get next week, they want to know if it's going to cause me any side effects when I, when I become 70 years old. So they're all very good questions and you can't answer the question about uh, will this drug cause me side effects if I take it for 45 years unless people have studied, people have been on it for 45 years. So we don't really have a ton of information on long-term use of these drugs yet. But uh, we're, you know, compared to some of the other drugs that we use, these ones have been around for a pretty long time. So we're accumulating quite a bit of good information on that. And so far, we're still considering them pretty safe for most people. So when it comes to looking at what sort of stimulants do we have, um, most of them are either uh, amphetamines, uh, which include the large class of dexedrine drugs and methylphenidate, which is uh, Ritalin, is mar marketed for the most part as Ritalin. So we have short-acting drugs, so these would be drugs like dexedrine or Ritalin that you, your child would take or your adult would take. Five milligrams, lunch, breakfast, lunch, supper, breakfast, lunch, supper. So it's, um, it's always been a problem with kids who are used, you know, you, it's hard to send your 10-year-old kid to school with, he can give him his morning pill at home, then you send him his lunch and expect him to remember to take his five milligrams of dextrine at lunchtime, and if he doesn't, then he's not gonna have a good day at school in the afternoon. So it's, you know, you can see the difficulty with the short-acting drugs. With all short-acting drugs, you swallow one, works really well for a couple hours, and then it dribbles off and doesn't work very well for a while, and you take another one, then it works and it doesn't. So we kind of move away from the short-acting drugs. So we, then for a long time, we were using more and more what they call the intermediate acting drugs. So both Ritalin and Dexedrine have a slow release form, <clears throat> which according to the manufacturers should work for somewhere about eight hours, but there's a fair bit of variability in people. So for children, for example, if you take one of these tablets that's a slow release preparation, you take it in the morning, it should be effective in exerting some positive effect at least until you're finished school, maybe if you're lucky till supper time. And then you get into this whole question, you know, is that good enough? So you, so you get your child's brain working more normally so that he can do well in school, but what about work? What about social things? What about temper at home at night? I mean, do you, or do you want your child's brain to be nice and healthy all night long, but not to interfere with the sleep? So I think in the last, uh, probably in the last decade, maybe more, more so even the last five or six years, People are realizing that, you know, children probably, if, if they have significant ADHD, should have something going on in their brain to help them deal with their symptoms, you know, effectively 24 hours a day without interfering with their sleep. So the whole idea of giving, it used to be that we would, uh, we would give kids uh, medication to help them from 8 o'clock till 3.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. We'd give them nothing for the evening and we'd give them nothing on the weekends. So then they would do better at school and they would get into trouble on the weekend and end up in jail or end up being kicked out of the house or something or when they're older maybe getting into car accidents. So it sort of evolved into believing that pe people should be on drugs that are effectively coursing through your system and doing something for you for the majority of time that you're awake. And that's the way most people prescribe them these days. So even these then are a bit short acting. They kind of tend to peter out by supper time. So now we have some kind of truly long-acting drugs like Concerta, and there's another one out called Adderall. Adderall is, is a mixture of amphetamine salts, and Concerta is methylphenidate or Ritalin in a very fancy space-age capsule that allows the, uh, the Ritalin to seep into your system over probably a 12-hour period as opposed to a six or eight-hour period. So these are probably the drugs of choice these days. 
<clears throat> uh, the problem these days has become that they uh, are very expensive and a lot of the a lot of the companies and various places where people get their drugs abused, uh, reimbursed don't cover them. Um, some of the companies, particularly Janssen Pharmaceuticals, who make Concerta, are pretty generous in providing people with samples uh, with, with uh, appropriate requests from physicians. So you can kind of get around that and uh, they, you know, I think this is kind of the state of the art. So there are a couple other uh, things out there these days. The other type of a stimulant that's on the market these days is sort of a stimulant precursor. So there is a there is a drug out there whose name escapes me right now. It shouldn't, but so there is a drug out there that's what they call a preamphetamine. So if you swallow this drug or if you put it in a transdermal patch, it, your body will absorb it. Then your liver liver will metabolize it into an amphetamine. So it's useful because you can't sell it downtown because it's not an amphetamine until it passes through your liver. It's really its only claim to fame. If it's in a transdermal patch, it has a nice steady, slow release over the course of the day. It seems to work quite well for a lot of people. I mean, when you, even when you really talk, when I was, I was in Ottawa a month ago talking to some of the people that knew a whole lot about this sort of relatively new formulation of stimulants and even with their best sales pitch, they had to admit that really you know, the big advantage is you can't, nobody downtown is going to buy it from you, and it, it does have a nice smooth action over the course of the day. So it really isn't a whole lot better than anything else, but it's a good choice. And all of these drugs, I mean, there. then we also have a group of drugs that are not stimulants. There's a drug out there called Stratera that is not in any way abusable. It looks very much like Effexor, which is an antidepressant. Nobody would want to take it if you didn't have ADHD. And then about 40% of people get some benefit from it. So 40% isn't quite as, as impressive as about 60 to 65% for the stimulants. But if, for example, you were dealing with somebody who is an amphetamine addict and you were nervous about giving them stimulants, which hopefully you would be, you might consider giving them a, a, something like Stratera. <clears throat> when I was a whole lot younger, we used to use a whole variety of things for ADHD because we didn't have so many options. And we used to use some of the old antipsychotics combined with some of the old antidepressants. And actually, we had really very, very impressive results. So in a lot of uh, places where they're sort of expert in treating ADHD, they say there are a group of people that respond really well to stimulants. That's about a third of the people. Then a group of people that respond very well to non-stimulants like Stratera. Then another third of people that will respond fairly well to a mixture of these other things like antipsychotics and and antidepressants, and I don't mean to suggest that we're just trying to tranquilize somebody, but somebody, some of these drugs, we used to use a drug called uh, Pertifrain, which was an old, old tricyclic antidepressant, and mix it with an old drug called Nuleptal or Pericyzine. And some of the child psychiatrists swore that that was by far the most, the most effective combination that they gave kids. And I know at the University Hospital when I worked there, there was a child psychiatrist who prescribed almost only that. And he had much greater luck, I think, with that than they did with all the Ritalin and Dexedrine. But they're not used a whole lot these days. But there is a whole bunch of stuff out there that people can use that are normally only prescribed in specialty clinics or by doctors that have a special interest in ADHD. So you shouldn't go away thinking that the only treatment is stimulants, because there's a bunch more. If you don't do well on stimulants, there's other choices. And for some people, clearly, there's contraindications to stimulants. If you have high blood pressure, it's probably not such a bad, such a great choice. If you have a long history of uh, being reckless with drugs, or your doctor thinks you might abuse them, or you might sell them downtown, then of course we wouldn't want to be prescribing those things to you. And in the states, I mean, in the states, they have a huge problem with diversion, where you get a lot of teenagers, I guess, going in and getting prescriptions for these drugs and then taking them downtown and selling them. And so, I mean, there's a lot of talk about that in the RCMP community and in the schools. And we don't really see a whole lot of that in places like Red Deer. You see more in Calgary and Edmonton. Nothing, nothing, nothing like you'd see in the States. But it's, it's something that everybody's aware of. And I think the pharmaceutical companies are responding to that by coming up with preparations that can't be diverted into the, into the non-clinical population. So, as a summary, ADHD affects about uh, 40, 40 to 60 percent of adults who were diagnosed properly with this in childhood. Again, that's not to say that all these kids will still meet the full criteria for ADHD when they're adults, but they will be symptomatic and have some symptoms that cause them problems. 
40 to 60 percent. I find really quite a lot of them meet the adult criteria for ADHD. So the diagnosis can be kind of challenging. Um, sometimes a funny illness. I mean, sometimes, honestly, people come into your office, they say, I read about this stuff in a book, or I heard somebody, my friend had this thing, and I really feel like maybe I do, and they just come in and list off all of their symptoms, and it can be really simple. And then other times, uh, it can be quite complicated. So, but it, it is a really rewarding illness to treat. It's generally often fairly easy to treat, and you get good results quite often. There's a lot of overlap, as we've shown you earlier tonight, uh, in the symptoms of adult ADHD and other common psychiatric conditions, such as depression and substance abuse, also anxiety and panic attacks. Um, <clears throat> there are some side effects of prescription or over-the-counter medications and herbal medications that can sort of mimic the problem. Thyroid problems can look a lot like ADHD, so if you have a hyperactive thyroid, you can look like you're, you know, running all over the place and hyperactive. If you have a very underactive thyroid, people tend to sit and be very in inattentive and gain a lot of weight. And street drugs also can confuse the picture. Um, most of the stimulant drugs and some of the non-stimulant drugs may be effective. So about a 60% success rate in terms of some significant improvement uh, using a stimulant drug and perhaps a 40 to 50% success rate of the non-stimulant category. But, and also, we have to remember that there's, you know, there are cognitive behavioral approaches to dealing with this. So, you know, a good therapist, a good psychologist who practices cognitive behavioral therapy in particular, especially if they have a special interest in ADHD, can teach you how to focus better, can teach you how to learn how to be less distractible, and can teach you how to have some control over your impulsiveness. So they do a pretty good job with that. And uh, it's hard to find CBT specialists that specialize in this, but they're out there. And, you know, these are things that you can learn about. You can buy books on this stuff. You can take online courses on CBT. You can apply most of the CBT that you might pick up on for anxiety or depression. You can understand some of the principles and apply it to ADHD online. There, and I'm done. So if there are any questions, I'd be quite happy to answer them. You know, there's, there's no differences in, uh, in frequency in terms of prevalence, and, but there seems to be a difference in that uh, I don't think we really know if it's an actual difference or whether it's just the people that come to see us, but the, we, seem, we feel that the girls are more likely to have the inattentive subtype and not be the hyperactive type. So typically we think of uh, boys are more likely to be hyperactive, and part of that I think is some of the, some of the boys um, are more likely to get into trouble and kind of get diverted into the legal system and the girls are more likely to come for help and get a proper diagnosis. So it's one of those things where we're not really sure if there's a difference, but if you look at the people that come into doctor's offices asking for help, there seems to be a difference. So we see more hyperactive boys and the girls in general are less diagnosed because I think a higher percentage of them have the inattentive type, and which is harder to diagnose because they're not jumping all over the place, right? So. It looks like there's a difference, and it's not really clear yet, I don't think. No, I think, I mean, you know, <clears throat> I think sometimes we uh, make it sound like psychiatry is such an exact science and something is either this or that, but it's not, uh, you know, lots of things kind of overlap and there seems to be, you know, we have a lot of medications these days that are useful for a variety of conditions and uh, something like Welbutrin that cranks up your dopamine levels like Dexedrine does, you know, is often, a lot of people will pick Welbutrin I think most people will pick it, will tell you that I'm nervous about giving this drug. Um, they're nervous about prescribing Ritalin, and they're nervous about prescribing Dexedrine. So they see um, Welbutrin as an, an, op an option that a physician can write a prescription for that doesn't require a triplicate prescription pad. It's not as diverted as often into the community, but these days they're snorting Welbutrin downtown as well so in some places, so people are kind of catching on to that. 
uh, but you can. You know, and Wellbutrin would be expected to be an effective option. Um, some of the other drugs like Effexor, you know, looks a whole lot like Stratera, and really I think sometimes it would probably be worth trying, you know. So in, if, you, if you try somebody on a stimulant and the sort of number one recommended drugs, if you kind of go with, if you go with what's recommended first, you would try kind of a stimulant, then maybe the Stratera, and then maybe the antidepressant or antipsychotic or combinations of the both, of both. So they're all, they're all used. They just have different success rates. But a lot of people say, I know, I believe I have ADHD, but I don't want to be in Ritalin. So then you try something else, sure. Yeah, as long as, you know, it requires a, not just an objective report. I mean, if, a patient, if I give a patient a bucket of, of uh, Concerta, and then they come back in a week and say it's marvelous, I'll have a couple more buckets. I mean, I need to be able to say for myself that I can see that their symptoms have improved. So if there truly is symptomatic improvement, it's pretty safe to say that, they're, that they have ADHD, yeah. If you had the right dose, you'd notice it the next day. So, which is kind of fun. You know, I had a girl in the hospital last year who was a 30, 32, 33 year old nurse, and she was also bipolar. And I put her on, uh, during the time in the hospital, it came out evident to me that she was running all around the ward and interrupting everybody, and she wasn't manic. You know, she was in there for depression. So, she was talking nonstop, she was interrupting people, she was buzzing all over the place. and. Then I sat down with her and asked her a bunch of questions about ADHD, and we ag agreed to try this. She had a brother that had ADHD. So we put her on something, some stimulant, and the next day, the next evening, she said to me, I read a book today for three hours, which is the first time she could remember doing that ever. And then before she went home, we had to tweak her dose a little bit and all that stuff, but, and that's not the way it usually goes, but it can happen that quick, yeah.